Our Papa, Tom McDaniel, is a wonderful mentor and role model, and we are going to tell you a few things about him. He graduated from Colgate High School. Papa attended Northwestern Oklahoma State University in Alpha on a football and basketball scholarship. He was the first person in his family to graduate from college. He worked his way through college and IU Law School as a church janitor, a referee, and as a court leader. Granny obtained her degree from OU and at the same time helped put Papa through law school as an elementary teacher in the Oklahoma City Public Schools. After graduating from law school, Granny and Papa returned to Alva where he worked as a lawyer in private practice for about 18 years. He continued his love for sports, working as a football and basketball referee, football announcer for Northwestern, and a coach of these sports. My name is Cole McDaniel, and I'm a junior at OU. My brother Josh is a freshman at OU and cannot be here today. Papa joined Kermagee and after 17 years retired as vice chairman and board member in 2000. Papa served as president of Northwestern Oklahoma State University, becoming the first alumnus to serve as president, and then served as president and chancellor of Oklahoma City University. He is currently the president of, Ameri of American Fidelity Foundation and serves on the American Fidelity Board of Directors. Papa loves Oklahoma City and the great things it is doing for the community and the generations to follow. He serves as chairman of the MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board. He was selected to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 2006. Papa and Granny were selected as Oklahoma Treasures of Tomorrow in 2010. Papa and Granny never missed a football, basketball, baseball game, or track meet for my dad and uncles. They continue that support for all the grandkids. He would tell you that his greatest achievement is his partnership and marriage to Granny, his family, and going to work every day to help others. It is our pleasure to introduce Tom McDaniel. <laughs> service with the Hallelujah Chorus. 
And if you've been to St. Luke's, you know that they have this beautiful sanctuary, they have a pipe organ, they have a magnificent choir, they have an orchestra, and they invite everybody in the audience to sing. And so, a few years ago now, several years ago now, Brenda and I were there one Sunday, one Easter Sunday, and at the end of the service they began to play the Hallelujah Chorus. And we all stood, we all stood, and that, half that particular Sunday, we had a grandson sitting between us. As the hallelujahs began to kind of reverberate all around that sanctuary, and as we kind of squeezed hands, I could feel the, the tears welling up in my eyes, much like I did when they were introducing me. And as we squeezed hands and listened to the listened to the Hallelujah chorus, it was just fantastic. And so after the service, this grandson says, "Papa, you really like you really like that music, didn't you?" And I said, "Oh gosh, I think it's so inspirational. I just think it's fantastic." He said, "Well, Papa, here in this bulletin, in this bulletin, it says after Hallelujah chorus, it says." G.F. Handel. What does that mean? And I said, well, that stands for George Frederick Handel. He is the person that composed the music. So he is the, he is the writer of the music. And he said, well, right under that it says these numbers. It says 1685 to 1759. What does that mean? He said, well, that means the years that he lived. He was born in 1685, and he died in 1759. And I could see the wheels turning. And he said, Papa, that means he had to write that 300 years ago. And I said, yes. Yes, he did. And he said, Papa, how do you do something that lasts for 300 years? Indeed, how do you do something that endures? How does something stand the test of time? How do good things, how do great things endure and it's that one thing that I want to talk to you about today how does something really good endure well usually it starts with a vision Handel probably closed his eyes and he could hear a melody that, that no one else had ever heard we know that great painters and great artists look at, a, look at a blank canvas and they can see a sweeping landscape or a towering mountain or even a Mona Lisa that some of us don't see. My good friend Cecilia and I work on the Map 3 projects and we marvel and are amazed that the great leaders of our city, past and present, had the vision to put water in a dry riverbed, hoping that someday someone would grow there. Someday someone would build boathouses there. Someday there would be a whitewater facility there. Someday Oklahoma City would be known as the Riversport capital of America, indeed the world. Those same folks had the vision to build a downtown basketball arena you know, when we didn't have a basketball team. <laughs> Hoping someday that we would, Christine. Hoping someday that our thunder would come along and transform our city as nothing else ever has. And today, 
Those dreams are still alive. I don't have to tell you what's going on downtown. If you drove down here today, you know there's a little party. <laughs> and I'm authorized to just say, all your complaints should go up to Cecilia. <laughs> We're in the middle also of building a downtown park, a 70-acre downtown park that will be available to kids that live in Oklahoma City for 100 years and well beyond. It will be the centerpiece of our city. It's great to be a part of. But for most of us, most of us common folks like you and me have to think to ourselves, I wonder how they do that. I wonder how Fred Bogart and his partners go into an empty shell of a building and they can imagine somehow or the other, Graham helping him as well, of course, go into an empty building and they see a stage and they see food being served and they see music and they see people singing and dancing and we have the Jones Assembly. Vision. Vision. Well, for you and me, it can come even closer to home because we're always, the opportunity is there if we can but grasp it. And I use this example lovingly. Brenda and I raised three very active, very athletic guys, and we always had during those years a garage full of shoes and balls and bats and tennis rackets and gloves and that sort of thing. And I looked at that year after year and all I saw was clutter. <laughs> Seven years ago, Mark and Stacy walked through their garage and they saw the same thing I've been seeing all those years. But they saw something more than clutter. They saw in that used sports equipment an opportunity for kids who could use that but simply had no access to it. And on that day, in that garage, Cleves for Kids was born. And today we gather, all of us here, to celebrate the success of Pleads for Kids and to consider its future. And I take just a moment of personal privilege to hear to say this. All of our family, both sides gathered here today, are really proud of Mark and Stacy. They saw something the rest of us didn't see, and they acted on it. They are both blessed in many ways, but they are, it is really interesting to me that somehow they have this vision to lead and a heart to serve. It is a rare combination. It is a combination in which we all take great pride. Well, it has been a, uh, an improbable journey for the past seven years, from the uh, garage to the grand ballroom of the Scarlet Hotel. <laughs> it's been a bumpy road, but it's also been a road that has led us from a table in a kitchen with a few parents and friends trying to plan how they would send some containers to a few schools. to an Under Armour backing a truck up at a warehouse that Jerry Gamble found for them and unloading 11,800 pairs of shoes that, as you heard Stacy say and saw in the video, would benefit more than 100 Oklahoma high schools and would also furnish shoes for more than 9,000 kids just a month ago. It's been a long road. It's been a long road. One of the things that I would mention to you is that in that long road, there have been many lessons to be learned. And 
the best one is the one that they emphasized in the video, the power of partnership. You heard both Mark and Stacy talk about that. We still have those young parents and friends that were sitting around the kitchen table. But now, they're a lot of work. They're a lot more. We have, well, you saw them. You saw them on the video. All the partners at Red Coyote that was, was recognized here today, Fields for the Future, the Police Athletic League, the Oklahoma City Public Schools, the wonderful Thunder organization, on and on it goes. And I would suggest to you today that the future is dependent on our power to continue to build those partnerships in the days ahead. And I can tell you that will be a major goal. Well, secondly, the mission of Please for Kids is to serve people in need. It's a mission that's as old as the Bible and as relevant today as it ever has been. It is dependent in great measure on being able to have one generation extend a helping hand to the next, and the next, and the next. No better examples than in this room, the Bogart family, Volunteer coaches, three generations, no better examples. No better examples than the McLaughlin family. Wow, they are transforming the facilities for the Oklahoma City Public Schools, Tim and Liz and their family. I just say this, generation from generation, one to the other, that's what it takes. And my friend Cecilia, Wow, investing her life, investing her life in the kids at Millwood High School. Example after example in this room. What we know is <coughs> that Cleats for Kids are trying to make that example work. You saw all of the, the stories about the team boards, the young professional boards, the kids helping kids programs. We know that if we're to succeed, there has to be a connection from generation to generation. We know that where the need exists and the help can be, be brought, that there is an intersection there, and that's where Cleats for Kids has to be at that intersection. Today, we know that there is no one more important to be standing at that intersection with us than that coach. That coach in whom the kid confides. That coach that observes the need. That coach who is willing to help. We know that that is the greatest connection between the generations that we need. And it's available in the classroom, in the locker room, in the gym, on the fields. So today I offer a sincere word of personal and heartfelt thanks to the coaches that are with us today and those all around our city and all around the state who likes to see you invest their lives in another generation. And I close with a personal story about a coach. This coach graduated from a small regional university a while back. He went to this small eastern Oklahoma town that hadn't had much success in football programs. And he knew he was going to have to get a lot more kids to come out if he was going to be successful. He heard that there was a new family moving to town. They had an only child. It was in the middle of a school year. They were told this, this kid was a freshman. And so on movement day, the coach shows up to help 
unload the moving van in front of a small white frame house. The parents said, we're moving in from a rural school a few miles away because our big dream is that our son can go to college. And they're not offering math classes that will get him admitted to college out at this rural school where he's going. So we're moving in here in the middle of the year. And they said, well, the coach said, well, can he play football? And they said, no, he's never played organized football. He loves basketball. He loves basketball. And the coach went out to meet the kid. And when he did, he saw a real tall, skinny kid. Seemed to be very lonely very apprehensive about starting to a new school. But somehow, somehow that coach and he clicked, Michael, there, like you talked about. They clicked. The coach said, a great way to get acquainted will be during the second semester, a lot of the guys that play football will start working out and they'll start throwing the ball around. And maybe if you could come out and join them, you could get acquainted and get to know someone. And he closed the conversation by handing this skinny boy a pair of cleats. And you guys from Millwood High School would not have liked them. These were not, these were, these were not the white, low-cut, shiny blue and white <laughs> shoes that you like. <laughs> these were black high tops. Dick Boker, do you remember black high tops? <laughs> well, these were black high tops. But to this lonely boy, they were magic slippers. Well, turns out the kid knows how to throw the ball. They, he learned a little bit about throwing the ball. By the time he was a junior, he became the starting quarterback at the high school team. They didn't do so great that year, but for his senior year, the coach says, if our team does well this year, and if you have a good year, you might be able to get a football scholarship to go to college. And his mom and dad were really excited because that probably wasn't going to be possible without it. Well, the year went on. The team did have a great year. They went to the playoffs for the first time in two decades. They got beat in the state quarterfinals. And the kid did have a good year. And sure enough, this coach kept good on that promise. He got him a scholarship to one of the small regional universities. And the two each went on their separate path. The coach moved up to bigger schools and better jobs in the course of his life. He would win a couple of state championships. And ultimately, he would help hundreds hundreds of kids throughout his coaching career. Ultimately, he would be inducted into the Oklahoma Coaches Hall of Fame. And that young quarterback that had kept in touch all those years was there that night he was inducted. Well, the boy, well, he never turned out to be a great player. But he was good enough to earn the scholarship. He was good enough to become a starting quarterback at a small university and good enough to get to play basketball. Be a starter on the basketball team at that university. Even more importantly, he got that education that his folks had dreamed about. Something else really great happened to him there. He met this really pretty girl <laughs> from the Oklahoma fan <clears throat> They got married. Those two things became the foundation for every good thing that would happen to him for the rest of his life. Forty years later, almost to the day, The skinny little boy and the panhandle girl 
went back to their alma mater as president and first lady of that university. First time in the 120 year history of that university that a graduate had ever been named president and first lady. Well, but this time, I knew you guessed. <laughs> <laughs> that that skinny, lonely boy that got the black eye dogs was me. I share my personal story with you today to emphasize only, only one point. When you help kids play, you give them hope. Hope inspires them to dream more, to do more, to be more. And when that happens, you can change their life. I know it changed mine. It changed mine. So I ask you to take this thought home with you You can only really fulfill your potential and destiny in this life when you help someone else fulfill theirs. Please for Kids offers us each in this room an opportunity to change young lives. If we do it, we will endure it.